Thanks, Alex. One morning in January of 2011, I put on my best suit and my best tie, and I walked into a big white building full of lawyers. This is the Federal Trade Commission building in Washington, DC. Um, and this would be my workplace most days for, uh, for the next 20 months. I want to talk to you today about what I learned in doing that, about why government is the way it is from a computer scientist's viewpoint, and uh, a little bit about what we can do to try to, um, to, try to address it. Now, first, I need to uh, answer the uh, first question that most computer scientists ask me when I say that I did this, and that is, what in the world were you thinking? Um, I know a lot of people in, um, in our community uh, would prefer to avoid a big white building full of lawyers at all costs. Many people in our community would prefer to walk into a Sharknado, which is just as scary, but at least you don't have to wear a suit. <laughs> Nonetheless, I did, in fact, walk into this building. This was my workplace. These were my peers, and this is what I worked on as the chief technologist at the Federal Trade Commission for the better part of two years. Now, um, I was the first person in that position, and I wasn't exactly sure what was going to happen, nor were the people there exactly sure what was going to happen, because it was clear um, that we were communicating across some kind of border, that there was some kind of cultural divide between the culture of uh, Washington lawyers and the culture of computer scientists. And I felt like every day, um, as, or every week, as I went back and forth between my home back in Princeton with my uh, colleagues and students um, and um, in Washington, that I was crossing a sort of, uh, some sort of checkpoint Charlie. Um, and indeed, there is a kind of cultural gap and often misunderstanding that occurs across this boundary. And this is one of the main issues that we need to deal with. Um, so first of all, um, the folks who live on our side of the border uh, don't always have a high opinion of the people on the other side. You remember this guy, Senator Ted Stevens, right? And his um, famous saying about the internet, um, which, well, the sound's not working. He said the internet is not a thing that you just throw something on. It's a series of tubes. And so we all made fun of that. Here's, you know, a series of tubes. Um, even John Stewart made fun of, here's John Stewart making fun of Senator Stevens. Now, this is actually a little bit unfair, because when we talk about the internet, we talk about pipes, not that different from tubes, really. And the idea that there is a pipe or a tube that has limited capacity and that you can't put too many things through it in a short period of time, that's actually something that someone in our community might say and using a very similar metaphor. But nonetheless, this meme went crazy um, because the idea of politician who's clueless about technology and doesn't get it is one that resonated. That because this fed into our often low opinion of folks in that world, um, this meme really took off. All right, so maybe we don't um, think all that highly of folks on the other side of the border, but um, I got news for you, they don't think so highly of us. Um, when they think about a typical member of their community, they're thinking about this guy <laughs> living in his parents' basement, um, uh, maybe doing, I don't know what he's doing, but it, it <laughs> probably isn't good. Um, here's General Michael Hayden, the uh, former NSA director, talking about us as a bunch of 20-somethings who haven't talked to the opposite sex in five or six years. Um, come, air quotes, I love the air quotes. Um, now, this degree of cultural distance, this misunderstanding, existed for a long time, and frankly, folks on the political side of this divide mostly just ignored what was happening in our community as relatively insignificant until this thing happened. That is SOPA and PIPA. Um, a bill that was um, on the table in the U.S. Senate, uh, which caused really an extraordinary, um, uh, an extraordinary uprising among digital citizens. It caused uh, Google and Wikipedia and other sites to go black. Um, and all of a sudden, uh, a, a dozen or more senators changed their position on this bill in one day. And everyone in Washington wondered what the heck was go was, had happened. Well, this was an opportunity for us. It was an opportunity in that the political class was suddenly uh, paying attention to what we were doing. It was an opportunity to go there and meet with them and work with them. Uh, and this happened around the time that I went to Washington. 
And so here, here we had this opportunity to go and to try to bridge that cultural divide. <laughs> now, I love this photo for so many reasons, but especially because it looks like Elvis is just in a different photo. This almost looks photoshopped, right? Elvis just pops off the screen, whereas Nixon's kind of flat, right? But actually, it's not photoshopped. This is an actual photo. And this, more or less, is what we were trying to do, um, trying to figure out how to work together despite being very different and coming from different worlds. OK, so I went to work at the FTC. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about where I went and what I did. So the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, is a relatively small federal agency. It has about 1,100 employees. Um, and it has two missions. First is consumer protections. If someone is ripping people off online or off, the FTC um, can do something about it by bringing a law, law enforcement action. The second mission was is antitrust or competition, uh, which after all is a form of consumer protection in the sense that one of the primary protections for consumers is the efficient operation of the market and market competition. Um, and so as part of its consumer protection mission, uh, the FTC <coughs> does antitrust. The FTC is a, primarily a civil law enforcement agency. That means that uh, the agency files lawsuits against people who it believes are breaking these laws. So this is the environment that I went into. Consumer protection, a big deal online. You might have heard about this, but from time to time, people try to rip other people off online. There are some minor issues with online privacy. That's all the FTC's business. OK, so my job was the chief technologist. I basically did three things. I was a senior policy advisor to the chairman, uh, who is the head of the agency. Um, I was an internal technology consultant on all things technical within the agency. If anyone in the agency was working on an enforcement or an investigation that touched on computer science issues, they could come to me, and I would sometimes help them. I would try to help them. Um, and the third thing was I was an ambassador to the tech community, both to the research community, but also to, uh, uh, to the industry. The two things I didn't do were management, nobody reported to me, or infrastructure. If the network crashed in the middle of the night, it wasn't my problem. Um, so um, this was roughly what I did. So I went and I tried to build this gap, working for the better part of two years with, um, with some of the Nixons there. Uh, actually, they're much better than Nixon. Um, but let me talk a little bit <clears throat> about this process, the process of working together between a technical expert and, um, and a policymaker. Because that is really the core of, um, of what I was supposed to be doing, and it's the core of how we can contribute as a community to um, good policy. So we have this kind of abstract idea of how this is supposed to work. You have an expert, and you have a policymaker, and we want them to work together. OK, so the expert has access to truth, um, and that truth, we believe, is useful in making good policy. These two parties engage in some kind of a protocol in which truth is conveyed, and questions are asked, responses are given, and good decisions are made, and good policy is made, and then we're done. Uh, that's how we'd like to think it works. Often it works kind of like this. You have somebody over here who's kind of a pseudo-expert who talks to the policymaker and tells them the things that are in the interest of the pseudo-expert's employer, or in the interests of the pseudo-expert themselves, and decisions get made that aren't so great. And we find it incredibly frustrating when this happens, and yet it happens a lot. Um, policy decisions are made based on a technical understanding that is either non-existent or just plain wrong. Um, and I found that difficult. Many of us find that difficult. So why is it that we find that not only disappointing, but actually actively frustrating? The reason is that this phenomenon is reminding us of something very important that we need to understand, and that is that politics is not a search for truth. We might sit around in front of a whiteboard and talk about things. We're trying to figure out what's true, what's right. Politics is not about that. It's not a search for truth. Um, when you're engaged in policymaking, it's not like the West Wing. You don't. Um, you don't, have, um, uh, you don't um, engage in deep, probing, philosophical conversation about great matters of state while striding briskly down hallways. Mostly, you're trying to get to that meeting you're late for. You're trying to get that memo done. And oh my goodness, the, chairman's, the draft of the chairman's speech is, is, 
is due in 10 minutes. Um, it's not that uplifting process all the time, but let's face it, most jobs aren't. Okay, so, um, so the level of discourse that we deal with on an everyday basis is maybe not as high as we like. Uh, one, of my, um, one of the examples that bugged me a lot was when someone would come in and say something is not technologically possible. Now often the thing that they would say was not technologically possible was obviously technologically possible, and sometimes the best way to convince them that it was technologically possible was to give up arguing with them and just write the code. Um, <laughs> here's one body of code that I did uh, to prove that it is in fact possible to, uh, uh, to uh, reverse the hash of a 32-bit IP address in a uh, reasonable length of time. Here's the ten line, nine or ten line program that does it. It runs in about 20 minutes, um, and um, it was actually faster to write this than to explain to the person why he was wrong. <laughs> all right. We often see also that the discourse is not really of the sort that we'd like. Um, here's this guy who, um, I'm not going to name him, but that's a guy that uh, we had to deal with from time to time. Uh, and he wrote a blog post um, that um, threw around these terms, mob rule, Bolshevik, and star chamber. In a, which is quite impressive to get work all of these into a relatively short blog post. What was the thing that is mob rule, a Bolshevik idea, and a star chamber? Blocking third party cookies. Ooh. All right, so politics is not a search for truth. Um, and uh, we have to figure out how to deal with that. Now, we, at this point, we could just be disappointed. Say politics is not a search for truth. Search for truth is what we're about. Let's get out of here. Um, but in fact, often the fact that politics is not a search for truth is in fact a feature and not a bug. Let me explain what I mean. Um, well, the, the reason fundamentally that politics is not a search for truth is that democracy is not a search for truth. Right? What is democracy? Um, what democracy is really is not a search for truth. It's an algorithm for resolving disagreements. And the algorithm is this. We can either do uh, thing A or thing B, how many people support thing A? How many people support thing B? Which one is more? We'll do that. That is, you might not, that, that algorithm is pretty simple and it has a lot of desirable properties. For example, no question is undecidable. No matter what the question is, you can take a vote, you can decide, you can move on. <laughs> and that's actually a plus, right? Because one of the complaints people have about government is that it doesn't do enough, it takes too long, it's too slow. Well. This process is pretty fast. No question is undecidable. In fact, all questions are decidable in constant time. <laughs> Just hold a vote. Um, many, many decision procedures don't have this property. This is very good. And democracy, the algorithm of democracy has this property. That's good. Another nice thing about the algorithm for democracy is that before deciding the ultimate question of what we should do, we don't have to first decide on the underlying facts. We don't need to decide how much the sea level will rise if we don't do anything about carbon emissions. We just need to decide whether to impose a carbon tax or not. We just need to decide on action, and we don't need to come to consensus on the underlying facts. Now, the underlying facts should matter. We should take them into account in deciding how we're going to vote. There should be vigorous debate about what the underlying facts are, but when it comes time to apply the algorithm of democracy, you raise your hand and you count. We don't need to agree on the facts, just on the course of action. We don't even need to have a coherent explanation for why we did what we did. Because in fact, there might not be one. It might be that a third of the people want to do something for reason A, another third want to do it for reason B, and the, and a, and the other third doesn't want to do it at all. Well, that's two thirds vote for doing it, but there's no majority as to why. So democracy not only doesn't need to, but often, but doesn't and often can't produce a coherent explanation for why we did what we did. And nonetheless, you can decide any question in, uh, in, in O of one time. So that's good. All right, so maybe now we have an algorithm, we have a method where we have this simple algorithm for decision making, but before we do this, we're going to have a deep and probing and detailed discussion on the merits before we decide how to vote. And that actually sounds pretty good. And yet, it often doesn't seem to work that way. If you look at what actually happens in a government decision-making process, the individual legislators very often seem to behave in ways that are logically inconsistent. That is, not just wrong or weird, but actually not even consistent with their own positions that they stated before. They often seem as well to be indifferent to truth. That is, they don't even care or don't seem to care about arguments on the merits. 
Why would that be? Why would a rational, smart person, well-trained, with lots of experience in policymaking, behave in this way? Well, turns out they behave that way for a reason. Let me explain to you in the language of computer science why they do that. So consider the following model. All right, let P be a universe of proposals that, um, that, uh, that our government might engage in. Well, the individual proposals will be P0, P1, P2, et cetera. We'll assume to simplify the model that all the proposals are independent, which means that adopting one proposal doesn't affect the desirability of adopting another one. They don't kind of stomp on each other or interfere or reinforce each other. Uh, and we'll say a bill, that is a thing we're considering doing, is some subset of P, it's some set of proposals. All right? Now, we'll assume that each voter has a utility function. Voter I has a utility function UI, which you can apply to any proposal. We'll say that a voter supports a proposal if their utility for that proposal is positive, that is, if they like it. And we'll say that a bill passes if a majority of the voters support it. That seems pretty logical, right? If you're going to model democracy in this way, that seems like a pretty plausible model. OK. And we're also going to assume that voters are, uh, voters' utility functions, their views, are rational and self-consistent in a certain sense. And in particular, this sense. That if we're given two disjoint bills, B1 and B2, disjoint just means that they don't have any proposals in common. That the utility to a voter of the two bills together is just the sum that the utility they would get from the two pieces separately. Right? This makes sense. These bills are independent, they're disjoint, and therefore the voter should sort of think of them, evaluate them separately, and just add up their effects. So we're going to assume that all voters behave in this way because that's just rational. Okay, so now you can show this corollary. Here's an easy corollary given two disjoint bills. If a voter supports B1 and that same voter supports B2, then they support the combination of B1 and B2. That's an easy corollary of the previous definition, right? Because uh, this means that their utility of B1 is positive, their utility of B2 is positive, therefore the utility of B1 uh, union B2 is also going to be positive. Okay, <clears throat> so now all we need to do is take this result that shows that voters' opinions, their support, is logically consistent in this sense, that if they like two things separately, they also like them together. And we just need to extend this to apply to the population as a whole. So here's the theorem we'd like to prove. Given two disjoint bills, B1 and B2, if B1 passes and B2 passes, then B1 union B2 passes. Great. Uh, the only problem is that's actually not true. That's not a theorem. Here's a counterexample. Here you have two bills, B1 and B2, and three voters, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. Alice likes B1 a little, but really hates B2. Bob really hates B1 and likes B2 a little. And Charlie just likes them both. So B1 gets two votes. B2 gets two votes and passes. But the combination gets only one vote. Only Charlie likes it. So even though the two separate bills um, had, would pass, the combination wouldn't. And in fact, if you think about it, the only thing that you can actually prove is that if B1, in general, is that if B1 passes and B2 passes, then somebody will vote for the combination. But you can't, but in general, no more than one person will be guaranteed to support the combination. So that's interesting. Even though the voters who participate in this process act in a way that's logic, logically consistent, the outputs of the democratic process are not logically consistent. That's a hint that there's something interesting going on here, which, um, uh, which is going to lead to counterintuitive behavior. All right, but now let's generalize the model a little bit. All right, let's take these voters. Let's partition the voters into districts. Um, we're going to have a legislator with one representative per district. And we're going to say that the representatives just reflect the opinion of their constituents, that a representative supports a bill if and only if a majority of their constituents supports it. Right? So representatives just try to do what their constituents would have them do. So what are the implications of this? Well, one implication is that a legislator's behavior is not logically consistent. Could be that they support B1 and support B2, but they don't support the combination. Why? Because while the legislator's support of a bill 
is basically the same as asking their constituents to vote on that bill. And the fact that the constituents would pass B1 and that they would pass B2 does not imply that they'd pass the combination. So the legislator might support the pieces but not support the combination, even though the bills are disjoint. Also, the legislator doesn't care about the facts. Why don't they care about the facts? Well, they just do what their constituents tell them to do. What the legislator wants to do is simply say, do more of my constituents support this thing or do more of them oppose it? That's all I need to know. My constituents may care about the facts, they may debate the facts, but at the end of the day, I'm just counting, I'm just counting noses. Right? Remember this slide from before? Individual legislators seem logically inconsistent and indifferent to truth. Well, that's exactly what our model predicted could happen. So what that shows is that the political process behaves weirdly, not because the people in it are stupid or corrupt. That's sometimes true, but generally not. But simply because the structure and design of the system is such that it induces these sorts of behaviors. <coughs> but there's more. Let's talk about legislative strategy, right? Because bills are not introduced separately, people have choices of which bills will exist. Consider the following problem. I'll call this the amendment problem. We're given some bill B and a set of possible amendments, A1 through AN, and all of these are mutually disjoint. The question is, can you add a subset of these possible amendments to the bill to make an amended proposal that will pass? So this is a general problem that you could apply in this model. Well, guess what? This is NP complete. Um, uh, I'll leave this as an exercise for the reader. Uh, but it's not, actually not that hard. So legislative strategy, even in a simple model like this, turns out to be NP complete. Well, maybe these guys are smarter than we thought. Um, what this tells us is that if legislative strategy is NP complete, it means that the strategic behavior of legislators is likely to be even more mystifying than their votes on individual bills. We'll see people trying to kill a bill by adding amendments that they support. Um, oh, oh, We'll see people um, voting for or introducing bills they don't support um, and all kinds of crazy behaviors because the, the space of legislative strategy is really complicated. And of course, the real world is even more complicated than that. In the real world, individual voters are not self-consistent. Voters um, have a lot of things to think about in their lives and they often make decisions based on heuristics and heuristics generally lead to behavior that's not necessarily self-consistent. In real life, legislators make deals. I'll support this thing I don't really like. If you'll support this other thing I want that you don't really like. Um, and that means that people often behave in ways that are even contrary to what appears to be their interest because there's some bigger deal that's being made. All right. Now, once you talk about executive branch agencies, then things get even more complicated. Executive branch agencies, of course, um, regulatory agencies, for example, um, aren't the, the, the people there are not elected. The leadership of the agencies are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. The staff of the agency are hired as civil servants. They're accountable to voters only indirectly. And um, naturally, that extra level of indirection that you have here compared to a legislator doesn't make things any simpler and doesn't make the process any easier to understand. So bottom line, Loc what you find is that locally, the system is likely to look irrational. It's going to look like people are crazy, they're working on things that we don't understand, that don't make sense, um, and we don't understand why they don't just do the simple thing that's obviously right. But that, of course, doesn't imply incompetence or corruption on the, on the, on the, uh, um, on the part of the people who are participating in the system. All it means is that what's going on is really complicated and we might not understand it. Okay. So what should we do? What should we, as computer scientists, do about this? We know that there are important decisions being made about technology. There are important decisions for which we actually have input to offer that's valuable and can lead to a better decision. How can we actually go about getting to a better decision? Now, we have this saying that we like to, to, uh, to throw at people in the political world, that it's not OK not to know how the internet works. Um, and I'm actually going to dispute that later. But I think. Uh, th the argument could equally well be thrown back at us that it's not okay to not know how government works if you're going to have an opinion about it. So, but, but let's try to get past all of this and let's try to talk about how we can actually work together. 
Remember that Einstein and the Obama earlier, the expert and the policymaker. How can we actually work together? Let's talk about what that process looks like from the standpoint of the different participants. Uh, and this is, a, this is an area where I have a lot of experience because I spent the better part of two years working with uh, senior policymakers in the FTC as they had to try to make decisions about a lot of complicated issues that related to technology. Okay, so what does it mean for a policymaker? The first thing to, to, to re recognize is that these people need to be generalists. And it's all well and good to say that they should learn a lot about technology because technology is important and complicated and they have to make important decisions about it. And that's all true. But a senior decision maker has to make important decisions about all kinds of complicated things like, say, healthcare economics um, and um, energy policy and um, so on and what the budget for the Centers for Disease Control should be. These are very complicated issues. And just as complicated, or sometimes even more complicated than what we do. And it's too much to ask that a policymaker would actually acquire expertise in all of these areas. The fact is, they don't need to be an expert. They just need to be able to make good decisions. They need to be able to make good decisions in the same sense that most of us can make a good decision about something like whether to have knee surgery. Right? Now, a few of us here, probably, probably maybe none of us here, uh, actually know much about orthopedic surgery. And yet, if we had to make a decision about whether to have knee surgery, we would know, a, we, we kind of know how to go about getting to a good decision. We would talk to experts, we'd have a certain kind of discussion with them, we'd get a second opinion, maybe we have some relative or friend who has some background in the field, and so on. We might go read some primary literature, um, but we would be able to make a good decision, even though we're not expert ourselves. Um, the goal here is not to become expert, but simply to not be clueless. So um, our goal, or to put it another way, is to climb the ladder of cluefulness, uh, which is something that um, I observed um, people trying to do in the DC world. So here's the ladder of cluefulness. At the bottom of the ladder, we have um, the lowest level of cluefulness, which is to recognize that there is such a thing as expertise in this area. That there is such a thing as expertise in computer science. And that some people have it and some don't. Now you might think that everybody in the world knows this, but no, that's actually not true. The, the next level of the ladder of cluefulness is to recognize an expert when you see one. That down here you know that there is such a thing. Up here you can actually tell that when Alex Halderman walks in that he actually knows something about computer security. That he's a true expert. And the top level of the ladder of cluefulness is to be able to work effectively with experts. Um, and so I found myself in working with people who had less experience in dis making decisions about technology, um, try to help them climb this ladder to get to the point where they could actually work effectively not only with me as an expert, but with other experts who they were able to identify themselves. So this is something anyone can do with some practice and some good guidance. OK, but what about us sitting on the Elvis or Einstein side of the table? Uh, what should we be able to do? Well, really, we need the, the top of the ladder for us is to be able to work effectively with the decision maker, to be able to help them make a good decision. So let me talk about how we can do that. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we often try to do it and do it wrong um, in our community. Um, and I'll do that through an analogy. The analogy is this. The analogy is that your friend Ed has come to town and he wants to know where to have dinner. Now, Ed is the decision maker. You're the expert. You know the local restaurants. Um, and so the goal is to help him make a good, him, me, make a good decision about where to have dinner. Okay, so how do we go about that kind of process when it comes to technology? Well, one thing that we sometimes do uh, is to say, well, our job, we don't get involved in policy decisions. Our job is to provide facts. We'll give the decision maker the facts they need, then they can do all that grubby policy stuff and decide what to do. That's the just the facts approach. Okay, so to apply that analogy to our restaurant case, what we do is this. Uh, we give our friend uh, menus from all of the restaurants in town and a textbook on nutrition, <laughs> and that's it. Now you have all the information you need to decide. Now, that's not actually helpful. Because what the decision maker needs is not just an unorganized pile of facts without context. 
that doesn't actually help them make the decision. If, if you were to do that to me, I would just get mad and throw those things on the floor and, and, and look on Yelp, because uh, Yelp might actually be more helpful. Okay, so that's one thing we can do wrong, is say we're just going to provide facts, we're not going to participate in the conversation. Another thing we can do wrong is simply dictate the decision. That is, we just think about, if I were the decision maker, what would I do? And so, right, maybe you really like a good burger and fries, and you just tell your friends, oh yeah, you should go that, to that place. Now, maybe that's a great decision, right? Maybe your friend really likes burgers and fries, but maybe your friend's a vegetarian. Maybe their doctor told them to watch their um, cholesterol. Maybe they just hate big, tall burgers. Who knows? The decision that's good for you is not necessarily good for them. And you're not doing them any favors by telling them, well, it's better than nothing to know where you would go, but that's not what I want to know necessarily in deciding what to do. Um, it's not necessarily the right decision. And furthermore, in a public policy setting, there's another problem with it, which is um, that if you try to do this, um, a good decision maker will probably just ask you one question. Who elected you? Who uh, did, did the public elect you to this office? Did the president nominate you and the Senate confirm you to be the decision maker here? I don't think so. Your job is to advise me. I'm the decision maker. And you shouldn't just be dictating the decision to me. So that's not going to work any, uh, either. All right, well, here's another approach. We'll just download, you just download your brain into the decision maker's brain. So there, your idea is you take your friend, you tell them everything you know, all, not only just facts, but also your opinions and your tastes. And oh, I ate at this place last Tuesday, and the service was kind of slow, but that's because there was a, you know, that's because there was a basketball game nearby, and that's not the case tonight. So that probably won't affect you, and so on. Lots and lots and lots of facts. You're going to try to make this person as much of an expert in Ann Arbor dining as you are. You're going to give them a PhD in the topic. <laughs> that's not actually all that useful. Because remember, that decision maker is a generalist. They don't have long enough to become an expert. Uh, they have, if you're lucky, 10 minutes uh, to have a conversation with you. And then they have to make a decision and move on. So um, you have to do something more useful. So what can you do that's actually useful to help your friend figure out where to eat dinner or help the decision maker figure out what they want to actually do? What you need to do is figure out a way to combine your knowledge with their preferences. Right? You know the restaurants here, but your friend knows what they actually like. But actually, in practice, it's more like your knowledge plus their knowledge and preferences. Because there are things I know about the, my dinner situation. I know whether I have a car. Um, I know um, whether I have a meeting after dinner. There's all kinds of things that I, as the decision maker, may know. Uh, in the case of you as an expert helping a decision maker, the policy maker uh, the decision maker may know that, yeah, doing X may be a good idea, but Senator X hates that idea, so it will never pass. So we're not going to do it. It doesn't matter how good an idea it is. So you have knowledge of your domain area. The decision maker has knowledge about what's feasible in the greater environment, as well as policy preferences, and you want to combine those things to get to a good decision. Now, this is often stated as your facts plus their values. I think that's bogus. That's not the right way to think about it. Because they have more than just values. They actually know stuff, um, their knowledge and preferences. OK, so how do you actually do this? <coughs> it's really a simple two-step process. First, you learn their knowledge and preferences, and then you structure the decision space for them. So what does that mean with your friend who's here for dinner? Well, you start asking questions. Um, are you a vegetarian? Do you like spicy food? Um, do you have a car? How much time do you have? Uh, are you a foodie or do you just want fuel? How much do you care about atmosphere? Um, are, you willing to, um, are you willing to do something adventurous? Um, how much money do you want to spend? Et cetera, et cetera. All those sorts of questions. You get your answers. You maybe ask follow-up questions. And then you have some idea of what kind of things they actually like. Then, having gotten that information, you can structure the decision space. You can say, well, there's a really good Italian place. It's right across the street from your hotel. Now, it's more expensive than you wanted, and it will take a long time. But otherwise, it's maybe what you want. Or if you're in a more adventurous mood, and you're willing to ride in a cab for a while, you can go to this other place. The service is a little bit uneven, but when it's great, it's really great. And you might want to try that. Now, that's actually useful. That tells them, uh, that gives them a few options, and tells them how to decide between those options in terms of the things that matter to them. That's structuring the decision space, simplifying the decision for them. And that's the kind of thing you need to do. Note. That is a multi-round protocol. There's a lot of back and forth. 
a lot of conversation. And having done that, after your friend goes out for that meal and comes back, you can follow up with them later. Hey, which place did you go to? What did you think of it? And then you get more information. And next time they come to town, you're in a better position to help them. Right? So engagement over time is really important here in working with the policymakers and building up mutual trust so that they learn to trust your judgment and they learn to trust that your shaping, your structuring of the decision space actually makes sense and helps them get to a good decision. Because at the end of the day, they can't check up on everything that you tell them. The whole point of their working with you is that um, they want to put their trust in you to give them advice. And you can build that trust over time. All right, so what does that mean for the role of our community in the policy process? Well, first it means that we need to have boots on the ground if we want to have influence. You need to have that multi-round protocol. You need to build trust over time. You need the policymakers to know who you are, to know how you fit into the community, what the shape of the community is, um, and to actually nurture that relationship. So if you're at a career stage where you can do it, you should consider doing what I did and taking some time off and going and actually working in government. There's an increasing number of places in government that are willing to host people who are genuine experts and are willing to give you an interesting engagement <coughs> in a place where you can actually do some good. As a field, though, we need to think about how to create a career path for people to do this so that it's a positive career move for somebody to go take a year, a year and a half, two years, and go and work in a government agency and then bring that knowledge back. If you're working in an area like security or privacy, go work in an agency that does law enforcement in that agent area um, and learn something about how the policy process operates. To me, this was the equivalent. Going and working in government was the equivalent for a computer scientist of going into the lab. If all I ever did is draw on whiteboards, and I never actually went into the lab and wrote some code or tried to make something work, I wouldn't be as good a computer scientist. In the same sense, if I'm going to talk and talk and talk about public policy choices, but don't actually go into the lab of government and try to actually make something happen, I'm not going to be nearly as good at thinking about and talking about those issues. So we need to think about, as a field, about how to build incentives for people to do this. This is actually important. If we want good decisions to be made, we have to do what the economists have done. We have to do what, to a lesser extent, the physicists have done and build a presence and build a brand um, in decision-making space. We need to be in the room when the decision is going to happen. Because if you're not in the room, you can't influence what's happening. OK, now we have some distance to go. And I want to give a couple examples of ways in which um, government is not doing this well right now. Here's one. You might have heard about this. <laughs> Healthcare.gov, the thing doesn't work. Um, now, on the one hand, this isn't, this isn't on its face deep computer science. This is about getting a website to work. Um, nonetheless, it's a problem. And in fact, if you stop and think about it, what they were trying to do in building this thing was actually harder than you might think. Why was it hard? Well, it was hard partly because of politically imposed constraints. If you were a tech company, who wanted to roll out a service like this for some reason, you would roll it out gradually. You'd start with a small number of users, make sure the system was stable, and then scale it up. You'd start with simpler functionality, and once that was working for your user community, you'd add features gradually, testing each one carefully as you added it. And you certainly would not announce months in advance the exact date on which the system would go live for the entire user population. I mean, that's crazy. And you certainly would not try to build this big complicated thing that has to interface with lots of other entities, some of whom, frankly, are not that interested in interfacing with you. This is actually a much harder thing to get working correctly than you might have expected. Nonetheless, they kind of botched it. And how are they fixing it? Well, with um, a tech surge. Um, having not read the mythical man month, um, the solution here is to send in more people who haven't worked on the project before. Um, so that'll work great. Um, here's a story from the New York Times about, um, about this. Um, this is from November 10th. Um, health website tests a tycoon and a tinkerer. That's this guy, Jeffrey Zients, who um, is um, who's the person who the president uh, named to be in charge of the tech surge and to be in charge of whipping this website into shape. Um, so this guy obviously has a lot of experience in managing websites, right? Um, well, maybe not. So 
from later in the story. Mr. Obama's reputation and the electoral fortunes of Democrats could hinge on the work of Mr. Zients, a man who has no hands-on technology experience, although he has advised healthcare companies on business practices. In the universe of experts who might have been called in for rescue work, Democrats close to the administration say, there were others perhaps more qualified than Mr. Zients, but he was the best of those that Mr. Obama and an insular White House were comfortable with. This is no boots on the ground in our community. This is nobody working there who the central decision makers at the White House trust who comes from our community. And this is what happens. You have a management consultant um, sent in to fix this problem. Now maybe this guy is a great manager, maybe he can fix it, but clearly this is an indication of a problem. There was no one they were comfortable with who actually had experience doing this kind of work. Uh, we need to fix that. Here's another example. You may recognize this. Um, this, is one of the, um, uh, this is one of the Edward Snowden documents. This is um, uh, an actual hand-drawn um, diagram. This is a slide from an NSA um, uh, presentation, and this explains how Google carefully uh, encrypts the connection between the user and the Google front end, but inside the Google network, traffic in clear text here. Um, that uh, there were people uh, within the NSA who understood this, and they were eavesdropping on the network over here in order to, uh, eavesdropping on Google's internal network. Uh, and this, of course, um, uh, gave, gave rise to the famous um, NSA smiley face. <laughs> this. Um, which I just love. Uh, but this is another example of a lack of presence from technically knowledgeable people in the decision making process. So the NSA decided to do what they did um, in this space. But there are several bodies that are supposed to be exerting oversight over the decisions the NSA makes the intelligence committees in Congress, the um, civilian leadership in the White House, um, and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. Parts of all three branches of government are supposed to be uh, watchdogs over the NSA. They're supposed to be asking hard questions, demanding answers, and then uh, giving either guidance or limitations on what the agency can do. So what do these three bodies have in common? What they have in common is no technical expertise, no access to folks from our community who could help them decide this. And so the folks who understand stuff like, whoops, stuff like this and its significance, and the folks who know to ask questions um, about whether, for example, these unencrypted links, and it was known publicly that these links were unencrypted, um, were not present in the room when these oversight agencies were operating. And as far as we know, there was nobody in government who was asking the question because people in our community were not there. So important decisions are getting made all the time in government. We're, we have something to contribute, not to make the decisions, but to help the decision makers make better decisions. But for the most part, we're not there. And, and the first step in debugging DC is to actually figure out how to be there in the room and provide help to those who need to make these very important decisions. Thanks.